Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your your living word, Jesus. We thank you for your written word that we find in the scriptures. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you'd enable us to receive what our Heavenly Father has for us through the scriptures this morning, um, to receive them with joy, and that they would be words that would bless us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we had the gospel reading, which is probably quite familiar to, to most of us with the, uh, the miracle of, of Lazarus. As Father said at the beginning of the service, today is the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. It's also known as Passion Sunday. And the reason it's referred to as Passion Sunday is this is the day that we remember that Christ starts his journey of suffering. And the word passion used this way uh, means suffering. It's uh, from that Latin word. And so it's not like um, I used to think and wonder. Uh, we observe the passion of Jesus. And we typically, you know, define passion as having uh, an excitement, a real intense desire for or to do something. And I often wondered, why did Jesus have this intense desire to suffer and go to the cross? Well, on one hand, he did. But again, uh, the word really relates to the suffering that Jesus went through uh, before his resurrection. And so he's on this journey to Jerusalem. Um, at the end of the previous chapter in John's Gospel, John records that Jesus and his disciples are at the Jordan River. And this is where John was baptizing. And this is where Jesus receives the message that Lazarus is ill. And would you please come? Jesus accepts the message, but he doesn't take off right away. He waits two more days before leaving to head toward Bethany. And before he arrives in Bethany, uh, he's greeted once again with the news this time that Lazarus has died. And Jesus you know, responds, and he says that uh, this illness, you know, he had said it earlier, and again, this illness is not going to lead to death. So, we start to see God at work. And Jesus, uh, Martha comes out and gives him, you know, her message and, and says, you know, with this complaint, if you had been here, he would not have died. So on the one hand, she knows that Jesus could have prevented Lazarus from becoming ill and even dying. Um, and then Jesus asks her that question, um, do you believe? And he says, you know, I am the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? And she says, yes, I believe you're the Christ who's coming into the world. Okay? She acknowledges him that way. And we'll come back to that. And then Mar Martha goes back to her sister and says, the teacher is wanting to speak to you. So in a moment of time, Martha goes from referring to Jesus as the Christ to referring to him as the teacher. It's kind of an interesting change in titles to the same man. Anyway, Mary goes up to Jesus and she says the same thing. If you had been here. Again, the same complaint. So Jesus comes into Bethany. And what is he faced with? What does, what does Jesus 
encounter. What does Jesus see and what does Jesus hear? He hears these questions. He hears what's behind the questions. He hears and sees people weeping and crying. He sees other people trying to console those who are weeping and mourning. And Jesus is deeply troubled in his spirit, and he grieves. And then he asks the question, where have you laid him? And they tell him, come and see. And then Jesus weeps. Why does Jesus weep? Why does Jesus weep? On the one hand, he probably weeps because his good friend Lazarus has died. He probably weeps in union with Martha and Mary, the sisters of Lazarus. And he knows how troubling this is for them, that their brother has died. So there's this, on the human level, if you would, uh, weeping uh, because of the love for Lazarus and the love that he has for Martha and Mary. But God doesn't see us as we see one another. Typically, without the help of the Holy Spirit, we only see what's on the outside of one another. But God always sees what's on the inside. He always sees the heart. He always sees our soul. And Jesus is troubled and grieved because he sees and hears so much more that's going on. And he hears the unbelief of people. He hears the complaints of people. He hears the doubts of people. He hears the accusations of people that come from unbelieving hearts. Again, that question that Jesus so often puts forward, do you believe this? And it's sometimes the longest distance is from here to here, from the head to the heart. God wants it to go from here and to dwell here. So Jesus weeps because he sees and hears all these things that are characteristics, components of the people there around the scene of Lazarus. What does Jesus see and hear when he looks at each one of us? Does Jesus weep for us? Does Jesus weep because of us? What is in us that causes Jesus to weep when he looks at us, when he sees us, when he hears us, when he watches us in our everyday lives? What does Jesus see and hear in each of us? We're in this season of Lent, a time of fasting and, and repentance, a time to ask the Holy Spirit to show us these things that are hidden in our hearts that may not be visible to us. Certainly may be visible to someone around us, uh, but they may not be visible to us. We call those sins. And again, on Ash Wednesday, part of the uh, invitation, uh, we were invited to uh, lament our sins and our wretchedness. Now, which one of us wants to admit that we're wretched? See, no hands, so I'll continue on. <laughs> None of us want to admit to someone else that we're wretched, that we're a really good sinner, right? But God knows that. We say it in the Collect of Purity that we said at the beginning of the service. No secrets are hid from him. He knows us, every bit of us. 
We can't hide anything from him. And thank God we can't. Because again, as we, we said, he's a God of mercy. And therefore, he's to be feared. But he's a God of mercy. He does not give us what we deserve once we have come to new life in Jesus Christ and confess our sins. So Jesus weeps. And then he says, take away the stone. And Mary or Martha, I forget which one, says, whoa, wait a second. There's going to be a, a noticeable odor. He's been in that tomb for four days. The significance of that is that the Jews, a lot of the Jews believed that the serious decomposition of the body began on the fourth day of death. Sometimes happening so quickly that uh, a face might not be recognized. When did Jesus rise from the dead? It was on the third day. Jesus was a Jew. He wasn't allowed to enter that decomposition phase of death. He didn't see that corruption. He was raised before it. Take away the stone. In Ezekiel, God takes Ezekiel to this immense valley and he shows him all these dry bones. And he asks Ezekiel, can these bones live? And I think Ezekiel has one of the best answers anybody's ever given God. Only you know. You know? <laughs> Only you know if they can live. And then Ezekiel is obedient to God and he, he says everything that God wants him to. And finally, the breath of life goes in and they, the new bodies are alive and living. Jesus says, take away the stone. And then he, he tells Lazarus to come out. What does God see when he looks at us? How many dry bones does he see in each of us? How many stones in front of our hearts does God see? Or, how often do we look at someone else and think we're seeing dry bones, stones, impossibilities? You say, oh no, that person can't come to Jesus. That person, you know, they're such a, a lost soul. There's no way. Did God maybe say that about us? But he reached out and got a hold of each of us, as many others. And so we need to be very careful. We don't operate from that sin of pride when we look at one another. We look at somebody out on the street, in the store. Do we see dry bones? Do we see stones? Do we see hardened hearts? Do we see unbelief? Or do we see opportunities in God for other people? Just like someone saw an opportunity for each of us. And then Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. And I would guess that God said the same thing to each of us. He called us by name and said, come out, come out. Receive new life. In the prayers that uh, the ordination for a priest, uh, one of the, part of one of the prayers is, in the midst of life, there is death. We hear it sometimes, you know, in the midst of life, we're surrounded by death. And there's truth in that. But the scripture we read today shows us how Jesus changes that. 
in the midst of death, there is life. And that life is to be found in Jesus Christ, the living Son of God. And everyone, like he says, everyone who believes will have eternal life. That was the last verse from what we read from Paul today. The wages of sin are death, but the, uh, the wages of righteousness, belief in Jesus, our Lord, is eternal life. Again, God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world. God doesn't want to see any of us perish. He wants us all to come to him in his son, Jesus Christ, with the help of the Holy Spirit to receive life. So going back to, to Martha, she says, yes, I believe you're the Christ who's coming into this world. And then she later on says, ah, but there's going to be this odor. Now, at the beginning, that first response, she says, looking to the future. And the question what the odor is, what about now? What can you do now? And we probably all have that same question. Yes, I believe in, in Jesus, and uh, therefore I'm going to have eternal life with him. But I face these circumstances today. I face these relationships today. What can you do for me today, God? When Jesus first received the message about Lazarus, like I said, he didn't immediately get up and take off and head to Bethany. He waited two days before going. This is the Son of God. He waited until it was God's time for him to move. God, help me now. And sometimes he does. Other times, we have to wait for God to act. We have to wait for God to move. Is that because God isn't ready? I don't think so. I think it's because of us. We're not ready. God still has something he needs, he wants to do to get us to the place to receive what he really wants to give or do for us. So don't be misled and disheartened when we don't see God act immediately in our lives. Now, that's where it comes back to living a life of faith in Jesus Christ. A life of trusting and being confident that God is God and he knows. He knows way better than us. Again in the psalm, my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. They're much higher, they're much better. We need to remember that. So, in this world, in the midst of sin, in the midst of death, there is life, and it's found in Jesus Christ. So, if you already haven't, I invite you to seriously think about that invitation and accept Jesus Christ. Invite him in. If you have already done that, again, in this season of Lent, I invite each of us to renew our faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> so that when Christmas does get here, <laughs> but we're going to go to, through Easter and the Easter season first. Um, so let us prepare in this Lenten season for the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord.